Hey guys, you're listening to Metal Matters, a weekly gimme radio podcast. I'm your host, Mike Hill. If you like metal, punk, hardcore, or anything extreme, you've come to the right place. So subscribe and never miss out. Did you enjoy your holiday? I guess so. I'm not big on the holidays, but... I like taking time off from work and, uh, you know, sleeping and things like that. Yeah, I didn't get a lot of sleeping done, but, uh, you know, I did what I had to do. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed their holiday. Uh, Pretty soon we'll be back to doing our weekly schedule. And uh, Randy and I are getting together to talk about a classic record, Black Sabbath's Master of Reality. Yeah, all-time classic record for me. You know, some people... We did uh, we did a Dio record, you know. Uh, we did Heaven and Hell, and um, there are people out there. And hey, you're you're entitled to your opinion, but there are people out there that do not even consider that a Black Sabbath album. I've done some reading on it, and there are people out there who are, talk about the Dio era as oh, that's not even Black Sabbath. And um, I beg to differ. However. Those first four Sabbath records, in my opinion, pretty much tell the whole story of the Ozzy era of the band. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Although, I like all the records with Ozzy. Yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath is the fifth record, which I have a hard time saying isn't any as good as the first four. Sure. But, I mean, it's probably my favorite band of all time, so. Yeah. You know. Uh, but I love the Dio stuff, too. I love the Dio stuff too, man. But there's like that, uh, there's that faction like we talk about Black Flag. You know, people discredit Rollins or they have their favorite singer or whatever. I, I love Dio as a singer too. It's not Ozzy; it's apples and oranges. But you know, yeah, Iommi's writing the songs. It's Sabbath. I just think it's cool that people have differences of opinion. I think it's good that people can talk about these things, and you know, there's pros and cons to. Um, you know, both lineups, I think. and uh, But to me, you know, I, I this record is probably my go-to Black Sabbath record out of those first four, or the for all of the Ozzy records. I find myself listening to Master of Reality more than the others. Yeah, I don't know which one I, I would say go-to more, <clears throat> but, you know, prepping for this episode, I mean, I, I feel like all Sabbath is in pretty heavy rotation for me. Um, but this is, I can't argue with you that this isn't my favorite record by them. You know, it's, yeah. it's up there if it's not. Yeah. I think that you can find the roots of a lot of other styles of extreme music on this record too. I mean, um, oh yeah, so there, there are riffs on this album that bands have made entire careers out of. <laughs> <laughs> well, opinion. I think, you know, you could say it for, I guess the first four or five albums, but <clears throat> I think more so this one. You yeah. brought up the riffs. This is the blueprint, man, for like doom metal, stoner metal, sludge metal, whatever you want to call it. I mean, this record is the blueprint for that, in my opinion. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So this is their third LP, released July 21st, 1971. 1971, this record came out. It's a while ago. That's quite... You weren't even born back, back then, were you? No. I was probably being conceived around then. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully to this record. <laughs> it's 34 minutes and 29 seconds. <clears throat> recorded at Island Studios, London, England. You know what's cool is uh, we go back to these older records and it, uh, it always blows my mind how short they are. These like iconic records. Yeah. You know? I like that. Yeah. And, and we'll get into this in, 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 uh, in a little bit. But the other thing I really appreciate too is how quick these records were made too. Oh, yeah. Not only how quick they were made, but, uh, <clears throat> and this isn't just for Sabbath. There's a lot of bands back then, uh, Zeppelin, Van Halen. Uh, you can go right down the list of bands, Thin Lizzy. But uh, the turnaround on the, like, all right, the first Sabbath record was released in 70. Black Sabbath, self-titled. Yeah. Iconic record. Yep. Paranoid, equally as iconic, was released <laughs> the same year, yeah. in 1970. Yep. And then, you know, Masters, 71, Volume 4, 72, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, 73. It's three years, five of the most influential records ever made in heavy music. Yeah, and that, that also, it kind of plays into the whole idea of, like, the working class, like, Birmingham, 
uh, vibe of the band too, where you know, sure. I, I always had the feeling that these guys were like, I mean, they were. They like Tony Iommi was like a welder or a machinist or a machinist. Well, right, and you know, you well, know that yeah. led to him losing two yeah, of his fingers, exactly tips. the tips. <clears throat> and and I feel like this that that relentless schedule of releasing records and writing material was like all kind of fit hand in glove with like the idea of being this like working class like blue collar sort of band, you know, right. It, you know, like there are a few bands today that release material albums like that. Like, you know, the Melvins, for instance. There's some years the Melvins release <clears throat> two, three albums. And, I, you know, I'm a huge Melvins fan. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but those albums are not the same quality. No, hell no. You know what I mean? A lot of them are like a, a noise album or a covers album. I mean, these albums are legit some of the best albums ever made in my opinion finely crafted songs <clears throat> yeah you know, production great production right. especially for that era definitely man yeah i mean <clears throat> once again I mean, i'm gonna say something really unpopular about the melvins i stopped listening to them <laughs> when after houdini came out oh, yeah it's a while ago yeah so I, I they don't even really exist to me as a band well they have a i mean i i like a lot of records after houdini but i will admit I think that was there at the pinnacle of the Melvins. You know, there's some great records after that. Still great live. <clears throat> Although, even for me, I'm probably a bigger Melvins fan than you. You definitely are, because I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. You know, I, the last, like, uh, six or seven years, you know, I don't go see them every time they come around. I don't check out a lot of the records anymore. It's just uh, too much, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so, in... In the UK, the record came out on uh, Vertigo, and uh, the CD came out in 1990. Oh, let, me, let me redo that part here. This record features the classic lineup of Tony Iommi on guitar, synthesizer on After Forever, flute and piano on <laughs> Solitude, acoustic guitar on Orchid. That's quite a... You know, quite a re uh, list of you know activities on this record for him. You know? Yeah, Fryomi. Yeah. yeah, expanded a little bit on this record, trying some different stuff. Geezer Butler, bass guitar. Bill Ward, drums, percussion on "Children of the Grave," sleigh bells on "Solitude," and Ozzy Osbourne on lead vocals. Produced by Roger Bain. Artwork design by Keith. <laughs> K-E-E-F Yeah Keith <clears throat> I need to get him to design some of my shit I think Yeah man Yeah Keith. I mean That That uh The album cover Is like Simplistic But it, it's hard You know what I'm saying It's effective Yeah Yeah It's a great album cover man. I, I agree that. man It's one of the cl I mean people That's another thing People Have been ripping off that design forever you know what i mean i mean high on fire did a shirt a couple of years ago that's basically said you know the same font the same color scheme says high on fire or whatever it's cool yeah my, it's like my other podcast everything went black actually in the beginning ripped off that that color schematic oh yeah yeah there, oh. it was the same colors and the purple yeah i don't remember that there was way 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 in the beginning Oh. Like the first, like, you know, episode one through, like, 15 or something like that. Okay. So I, f I felt like I was there from day one. But I don't know, yeah. man. Maybe obviously not. not. Yeah. <laughs> All four members are listed as composers, but it's my understanding that Naomi and Butler wrote uh, most of this material. Yeah, I don't think the Ozman did a lot of writing, per se. Yeah. Uh, the album achieved quite a bit of accolades. Um, in the U.S., it reached gold in 1971 platinum in 1986 and double platinum in 2001 in the uk it hit silver in 2013 and gold in 2016 isn't that isn't that crazy what? Now, like in england it's not the u.s is like by far that's their territory yeah that is crazy man canada it hit gold in 77 and platinum in the same year so that's north america is uh the home of black sabbath in my opinion mm. It peaked at number five in the UK charts and number eight in the US. Of course, you know, critics despise this record. <laughs> oh, you can always count on critics to not yeah. like something that's a masterpiece. Yeah. I mean, they didn't, no one, the critics didn't like Kiss either. You know what I mean? Right. Like right. one of the most commercially successful bands in history. Well, 
And and I'm not, that's not to say that because something's commercially successful means it's good. But in the case of Kiss, similar to Black Sabbath, they they had a you know they're, they're a, a creatively there's a lot of creative merit in their music, and also they went on to you know influence legions of other bands. Right. Well, I think more in modern times, uh, if you know, it's popular, it probably sucks. Probably in the uh, '70s, but then again, there's a lot of weak stuff from the '70s that was really popular. But yeah, but you know, but great bands like Zeppelin, Sabbath, yeah, that Purple, Rainbow were popular. That got like major airplay. Like, yeah, ACDC. Try, you know. Right. Try to turn on if there's even one left, like a modern rock radio station. Find me something that's worth listening to. Good luck. You'd have to really go to like Sirius XM or something to one of those curated like yeah, uh, but that's, that's a different or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Even that, I mean, it's cool, but they play like the same freaking songs over and over. That's know? true. Yeah, you remember WAAF in Boston? <laughs> oh, yeah, man, that's that's what I kind of grew up listening to a lot of the stuff we talk about from the seventies and eighties. I used to like get up in the morning, get ready for school, and put on AAF and like you know have my my eggs and toast, and that's where I heard a lot of this stuff. You know, I, I recently tuned into WAAF when um around Halloween when I went up to Salem driving through western mass yep. you know to, to cut across to the north shore i caught a radio station and they're playing some like guns and roses or something like that and i was like oh, i wonder if this is waaf and so, sure enough it was so there's still a hard rock station or a rock station yeah well you know it's it's funny to think of guns and roses as a classic rock band because you know i'm old enough to know when they were new they were like a new band right yeah same here you know and it's like you know, there's the GNR episode I did with Jay, uh, Jay Bennett where we talk about that record in specific. But I remember like 87 when it came out. It was like, oh, this is like, you know, some new shit. But it sounded like stuff from the 70s. And then now it's all kind of melded into being classic rock. It's right. kind of interesting. You know? That record, though, I mean, my, that might be the one of the last like <clears throat> major records that got airplay that I consider like good besides the Seattle movement stuff, you know. Yeah, but that's debatable too, really. Some of that, like Soundgarden and Alice in Chains, really are great. You know, yeah. I never was a big Nirvana fan. I wasn't either. I wasn't either. You know. Anyway, some of the um, <laughs> critical commentary on this record, the Village Voice called it dim-witted, amoral ex- exploitation, right up my alley. <laughs> to me, that sounds like uh, <laughs> like a raving review, man. Honestly, yeah. I feel like some of my bands got in the same review. Yeah. <laughs> Rolling Stones, Lester Bangs. Oh yeah, I think that's the guy who uh, his trip is more like television and like uh, Lou Reed and stuff like that. Velvet Underground. Yeah, you know, he didn't give it such a bad review. He was saying that it was mon- monotonous and and hardly an improvement over its predecessors. But he added that he enjoyed the lyrics. Well, it's good. I mean, the lyrics are good on this record, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh... Geezer probably wrote most of them. Yeah, doll. I mean, yeah. yes. Yeah. I wonder if Ozzy has ever actually written any lyrics, even in Ozzy Osbourne. Do you think he wrote? Well, well, well eventually we're going to talk about some of his later work, but yeah. Yeah, we'll get to him later. <laughs> I I don't know. It's kind of a mystery, man. He gets a lot of like times I read about Ozzy or Sabbath or whatever. He kind of he kind of gets spoken of in like not a very flattering way for what he contributes. Yeah. You know, he strikes me as a guy who just, like, maybe comes in and, and knocks out some vocals. <laughs> like, I could be wrong. Maybe he had a bigger hand in writing some of these songs, some of the lyrics as well. But that's not the feeling I get when I read up on this stuff. That's the feeling I get, too, as well. And um, like I was saying earlier, you know, it's my understanding is that Iomi was the riff guy, you know. And, oh. and Geezer was, like, the, the, the sort of... Uh, you know, he was, like, the Neil Peart of the band right. from Rush. You know, Neil wrote all... Neil... You know, we're getting off track here, but like, you know, Neil Peart was the guy who came up with the whole Rush lyrical rock opera like concept right. and everything. So yeah. all the darkness and apparently came out of Geezer, you know. Yeah, brilliant guy, man. Um, some of the uh, you know, as time went by, critics came around to the record. In uh, 2003, Rolling Stone changed their tune. <laughs> Go figure. And uh, ranked it at 298 of the top 500 albums of all time. That just goes to show you I don't give a shit what Rolling Stone says. <laughs> of, of time immemorial, it was ranked 298. Would that be higher on your list? 
I mean, yeah, for me it would, but it's like a- you get some jackass out there <laughs> who's into uh, some weak ass shit, then you know maybe two ninety eight's not so bad. Yeah, you know. Um, they also listed it at number thirty four of the greatest one hundred metal albums of all time. What was number one? I didn't. I didn't go that far. Probably not worth going that far. Probably, yeah, you know, trying something. It's probably Metallica. I imagine. Yeah, the Black Album. <laughs> it's a, yeah. I was gonna say it's probably either Metallica, like one of their worst records, or um, actually, how, what do you think of the Black Album? I don't like it. I didn't like it then. I don't like yeah, it now. I, I mean, neither, man. You know, it's like it's not as bad as some of the stuff they did later on. No, it's not. But it's. I mean, I think Enter Sandman is one of the worst songs yeah, ever. Horrible. Not just worst Metallica songs. I think it's one of the worst. Yeah. I hear that. It makes me cringe when I hear it. I kind of like Sad But True. Yeah, like that's probably better than almost anything they've done since then. But I don't like that album. I've never come around to it. I've never really revisited it, but I don't think I need to. But yeah, so you know, Rolling Stone came around and uh, you know, after the, the original lambasting of it, and um, it's funny, heavy metal never really was like a critical in, until much later in time. You know, I would say in the late 80s when people started actually writing about heavy metal in magazines dedicated to heavy metal. Yeah. Most critics didn't like the, this kind of music at all. Like even Zeppelin never got good reviews. Right. Like Purple. Right. Like none of these bands got any love from critics. Nope. You know, they were uh, busying themselves with, uh, you know, bands that I like, you know, somewhat. I'm not a big Velvet Underground fan, but I see them as being a, a band that has a lot of merit creatively. But that was kind of that was their, um, you know, their their darlings were bands like that. You know? Yeah, I don't think they looked at metal as like or as artistic. It was more of like a Neanderthal <laughs> kind of deal, you know, where like Velvet Underground and uh, television and the Talking Heads and stuff. That was like you know, like this real heady shit. Yeah, but like metal was kind of like. You know, for the dummies. Yeah, you're right about that, that yeah. and that's that's kind of like, yeah, it was it was a too much of a populist kind of thing. Yeah, and also those bands were successful too, cre- like c- commercially. Sure. You know, I mean, let's just face it. Sabbath was way more commercially successful than the Velvet Underground. Oh yeah, you by know what far. I mean? Yeah, by far. Like more. They would you would they would sell out like Madison Square Garden. The Velvet Underground would play in front of a few hundred people. Right. Right. So you know, and once again, there's the hipsterism of wanting to be into like really obscure stuff and you know sort of like um discrediting stuff that's liked by a lot of people you know oh even though a lot of what we do on this podcast is based on opinions and stuff i've never been a big fan of like critics oh no and people that review records and like i don't i don't that shit doesn't hold a lot of water with me no even with my own music like i i don't care like if people were Write a bad review and shit. I, I don't care. I always look at it as just one person's opinion, and there's very few people I hold at a higher standard. Like their opinion really matters to me. I'll go one step further about critics, and where I feel like people that you know, and I'm not trying to be like a dick, really, but this is just how I see it. People that write about music are people who generally have tried to play music and have been unsuccessful at that. So there's a little bit of a um, you know, uh, sort of aggressiveness towards other people who are successfully creating music. Now, whether or not you like that music or not, this person you're writing about, this group of people, this artist has been successful at writing a body of work and having it released in a way that other people can consume it. And your typical critic is bothered by that (laughs) because they weren't able to do something like that. Yeah, I could see that for sure. You know what I mean? And and that's just like, you know, years of, uh, of analysis and, you know, observing all this business, you know what I mean? Like the PR business, you know, in in general, like PR, I feel is like kind of, that's parasitic, you know, they, they make money, they make a living yet bands don't make a living off their music. It's crazy. It's funny the music world. Almost everyone makes a living off it, except the bands. Yeah, it's like the, it's like the <laughs> worst deal you can imagine. You know what right. I mean? It's like slavery almost. You know? Yeah, man. <laughs> you know, and uh, you had mentioned earlier about the the length of the record. Yeah. You know, and how a lot of the times the records are just shorter. And uh, back then, I was reading up a little about the different versions of this record. I guess early on there was some North American versions of the LP. Yep. 
where several of the songs were given like subtitles or like segments. Um, did you see any of this stuff? I think so. Like after forever was like the intro to that was called the elegy. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then the outro to children of the grave was called the haunting. Yep. And all these, uh, the intro to into the void was called death mask. That's cool. Yeah, I, it is. I, cool. didn't, I didn't see that. I don't. The version of the record I have doesn't have any. Of that Meaning, the one I, the physical version I have doesn't either. But I Death just it happened to be looking, you know, researching stuff, and there was like all these different versions, and I'm like, uh, I guess somewhere along the line, some of the track listings were screwed up too. And uh, those little interludes, uh, embryo and orchid, were were supposed to be separated by children of the grave, and on some of the pressings, they're they're not. They're back to back. So it's weird. There's like these two little. Little pieces there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought those, like, t- uh, subtitles of, like, intros and outros to the song uh, were pretty cool. Yeah. What I have is for the original UK pressing, um, there was uh, – the, this is the one that came back out came out back in the day. Uh, side one was Sweet Leaf, After Forever, em- Embryo, the, afor- the instrumental you mentioned. Yep. Children of the Grave was the last song on that side. Right. Side two kicked off with the instrumental Orchid, and then Lord of This World, Solitude, and Into the Void. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the U.S. LP pressing features The Haunting. So that, technically, that track listing goes side one, Sweet Leaf, After Forever, including The Elegy. Okay? Right. Embryo, and that's where you get the back-to-back um, pieces, uh, interludes or whatever. Got it. Right, right. Yeah. Children of the Grave with The Haunting. Okay. Okay. Side two kicks off with Orchid. Right. Then a song called Step Up. Which is the uh, intro to Lord of This World. That's right. Lord right. of This World, Solitude, Death Mask, and then Into the Void. Death Mask. Yeah. That's cool. It's a great name. Yeah, it is right? cool. Step Up is like, I think, like a, sounds like a Mad Ball song or something. Death Mask is a... Lord Mantis album, or yes. song. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think. Yeah, they, maybe they got it from the idea of this uh, this Black Sabbath. You think those thing. guys ever heard of Sabbath? I think they might have. <laughs> Knowing those guys, they may have. Uh, been, they might be familiar with Black Sabbath. <laughs> uh, another interesting thing is, uh, you know, the phenomenon in heavy music that started years back of tuning down your guitar. Yes, I think was maybe attributed to this album. Yeah, I noticed that when I was a young kid when I first heard this record. Wow, really? Yeah, no, man. No, I did not notice that when I was a young kid. Well, no, but I, all right, I think I was 11 or 12, maybe. I'm mean, trying to think. Like, I started playing guitar at, like, 12. So I had been playing guitar, and I had been t- tuning to standard E tuning. Right. Like, you know, with the little tuner you get and everything. Sure, yeah. That's what I started and doing, I remember, And I would try to figure out all these, like, Black Sabbath songs just, like, on one string, you know? Yeah. Because I didn't really know how to play chords. The same way I figure them out now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that you, I was like, how much lower? You can't get any lower. You were running out of neck. Man. Yeah, so I'm like, what the, you know, like, like was this a different instrument or what? What's right. the deal? And that's when I was like, yeah, this is like, those guys play in a lower tuning. And I, it kind of blew my mind that I'm like, that's, that's like, loud. It's pretty intuitive at that age for you to figure that out. Prior to, you know, in addition to playing guitar, I also played like other instruments and I kind of knew a little bit about music. Like I, you know, I started playing like, you know, like violin and clarinet and shit like that. Like right. prior to my, my delving into the guitar, the world of guitar playing. So I understood a little bit about where notes were and all these kinds of things. And, and I remember like, I knew what E was, you know, like, yeah, okay, yeah, the yeah. guitar is like an E. And then I'm like, the open E, you know, the heaviest thing, you know. And when this song, I, I'm like, when I first heard this record, I was like, this is like lower than the lowest note on the guitar. So they have to do something, is it, unless it's a different instrument. Right. Well, that's still a good pickup, man. I mean, I never had any musical training. You know, I bought my first bass. I brought it home, and I'm like trying to play with my thumb. And then like somebody told me <laughs> like about two or something. Like about two. No, not that. I was trying to play like my front hand, like using my thumb and not my fingers. And then like someone told me about tuning. I didn't even know you had to tune. I thought you know like just kind of like pick it up. Yeah, so I bring it. it down to this. There's this little place like six miles from my house out in the woods called the Guitar Shack, and it was literally a fucking shack in yeah. the woods. 
got like a wood stove in there, you know. And I'd bring my bass there and have him tune it. And like, finally, the guy's like, "Dude, you, I can't like tune your instrument for you. You're like, buy a fucking tuner, it's like twenty dollars." <laughs> so, so that's what I'm saying. You were a little ahead of me back in the day, you know. <laughs> yeah, I actually took guitar lessons for like maybe maybe like four months or something like that. I took one bass lesson. Yeah, yeah it's like. It's not necessary. I think it gets in the way, actually, of you learning the instrument in a creative um, way. But yeah, so the you know the tuning down um, to on the track children on the tracks children of the grave, lordless world, and into the void. I only down tuned his guitar uh, a step and a half, an effort to reduce the pain from him playing was man, why he initially did it. Man, he didn't think like this sounds sick i'm going to tune down I, th- I, wow. no that was like discovered that this sounds sick after he was like oh wait a minute like it's easier to play and this sounds sick and then you know i guess as time went on they were like well this will be easier for ozzy to sing yeah okay. but then they they would say he would sing at a higher register the lower they tuned <laughs> so it kind of it kind of backfired on him wow that's funny man <laughs> it's it's like it blows my mind how a lot of the iconic things about Black Sabbath were almost like afterthoughts, like the it, tuning and accidents, almost accidents. Yeah. You know, because I mean, this, I mean, like all their albums, you know, have made a huge impact on heavy music. But just this record in particular, and maybe it's just me, feels like it has as like a, a very long reach into the extreme music world. So yeah, think about I mean, tuning down. Yeah, well, I mean. Most heavy bands. Well, no one tunes in E standard right. ever anymore. You know? Very rare. You I know? mean, if you're tuning in, like C C standard is like almost the net, the, the regular. That's normal. That's right. like a normal tuning now. You right. Know? That's like E used to be. Yeah. You know, and now it's like okay, you know, we tune to like B standard or right. A standard. People, some fucking people tune to A standard. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like B standard or B flat is like, I and mean, that's more like a seven string. But like a lot of death metal bands will tune to that tuning. You know, like right. uh, like Cannibal Corpse or something. You know right. what I mean? But or they'll use seven strings. But it's like back when you know you were first starting to play guitar in, in the '80s or whatever. When I, for me, like in the '80s, it was like everything was an E. You know? Yeah. And then the the idea of and I thought it was just because it sounded like more heavy and evil. But it, it apparently what you're saying it's because it diminished the pain in his hands, <laughs> which is in- insane. Like crazy that led to like generations of of heavy bands tuning down and it sounds way more evil yeah of course oh man yeah it's so funny <laughs> but uh yeah it's like but like i was saying this record i mean you can like across several genres of music you can hear like you know bands like caius corrosion and conformity you know i hate one of our mutual favorites i hate god yeah man you know this record because of the tuning the plotting riffs also and, and i'm going to talk about more like with i hate god god i hate god is not like a straightforward band like there's all sorts of very intricate uh timing things that go on within i hate god's music yes that i think might have originated from either this record or even the first sabbath album that has like this kind of jazzy drumming in it well you bring up that's a great example you bring up i hate god and like we at first listen, a lot of I Hate God stuff sounds very simplistic. I <laughs> I remember that. No firsthand I, that it's not. Because, you know, not that I consider myself a great musician, but we got asked to be on an I Hate God tribute compilation. So we picked the song Pigs off the first I Hate God record. And then, oh, yeah, we'll knock this out in like an hour. Like we could not get the time. The timing was insane. It took us like multiple practices to even get in the ballpark of being able to competently play the song. Yeah. So the shit's not simple. Nope. You know, and I think that, you know, just this record too, even like the drumming, the timing, and you know, it's it's uh there's a there's a feel to this record, you know, like I'm sure I mean back then they didn't use like some of the things they use now, like click tracks and all that stuff. But there's a uh Sabbath has always had a very live feel. Like this version, the classic lineup of the band, yeah, has very always loose. had. What's that? Very loose, loose yeah. but not loose. Yeah, like a very <laughs> live feel. Like it has a feel of a band that plays all the time and like has been gigging and touring and rehearsing and putting like this organic spin to it. And you know that I think translates to I Hate God. Like that's why they have that sort of like 
similar vibe in that the music has like a looseness to it but also this like very the timing on stuff is always like in a weird comes in a weird place like the downbeats are in weird spots yeah it's like it's always almost like a one beat off but it's not yeah. it kind of gives it a little more soul yep. than a lot of stuff you know yeah um you know and you mentioned like uh, i hate god too in the real quick that you think of all the time sabbath has been covered Oh, yeah. By other bands, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I Hate God. Hydrahead Records back in the late 90s did a whole series called uh, In These Black Days, mm -hmm. Seven Inches of All Bands from That Time Covering Sabbath Songs. And I Hate God. I Hate, I hate God had the uh, Sabbath Jam. <laughs> it's called. That's right, yeah. Um, but when you think of all the, all the Sabbath covers, um, a lot of my favorite ones come from Masters of Reality. Yeah, man. And totally. even, you know, from that Hydra Head series, uh, Cavity doing Into the Void, crushing. Uh, Neurosis, Children of the Grave, great. That's also from this record. Brutal Truth uh, doing Lord of This World. That was from the uh, Earache compilation, The Masters of Misery. Um, Ulver, black metal band from Norway, on their album, Shadows of the Sun, covered Solitude. And it's absolutely amazing. But it's just, you, know, you can go on and on. Those all are covers from Masses of Reality that are great. Would you say that Paranoid is probably their most, well, all right, Iron Man and Paranoid are probably Sabbath's like two most iconic songs. Yes. Right? I know they're not on this record. I right. know that. <laughs> You're looking at me weird. But, <laughs> but I think that to maybe your average guy out there, like when they think of Black Sabbath, they're even you know someone who's just like, oh yeah, man, I listen to like classic rock radio, Black Sabbath, Iron Man, you know, Black Sabbath, Paranoid. But the more impactful, deeper cuts, I think, come off of this record. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. you know, Paranoid, Iron Man, and I'm even gonna throw War Pigs into that. Yeah, War Pigs too. Yeah, those are great songs, but you know, I'm pretty tired of hearing them. Yeah, they're like the Stairway of Heaven, right? Which is a great song, you know, Black Dog, whatever, for Zeppelin. Right. But I'm not sure if I need to put those records on. But And that's how I feel about Iron Man, War Pigs, and, uh, right. and Paranoid in some way. But even though I do listen to those records. Sure, yeah, you know. yeah. Same here. But the ones that I go to are on this record for sure, man. Yeah, this is more of like the record, like the Sabbath fan record. You know what I mean? Like. Not just like the radio jam. This doesn't really have. I mean, I guess Chil Children of the Grave would that be considered the the radio jam off this? I don't Probably Sweet that. Leaf. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, Sweet Leaf's like the, one of the iconic songs. Cause like, not only do like you know weed smokers across the world appreciate that song, the Beastie Boys like you had that sample on License to Ill. True. Where they have it, you know. And, do you know the story about the beginning of Sweet Leaf? I don't. So apparently, uh, Iomi was in the recording session for this record, was working out the acoustic guitar parts, and Ozzy walked in with a gigantic joint, handed it to him, he took a big hit off the joint, and then he couldn't stop coughing. Wow. Like the whole day, like for, I don't know, the whole day, hours. And the engineer ended up capturing some of that. <laughs> so that is the sample, the beginning of Sweet Leaf, is Iomi coughing from huh. smoking weed. Pretty wow. cool. Yeah. Those guys smoke weed? I heard that. <laughs> I heard that, yeah. I have an interesting take on that, and it's not. Uh, I mean, this is like a pretty far out. Um, like, this is this is. I came up with this idea while I was on tour one time, and because um, we were listening to Sabbath, this record actually in the van, and uh, I was thinking about how I was listening, really listening to the lyrics, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, it's about weed, man. It's about smoking weed." And you know, I thought, what wouldn't it be funny? If this song actually was not about smoking weed, but it was about the experience of a straight man with a uh, a, a man, another man who may be dressed up as a woman. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you're on tour. Yeah. How? how would well, you like the, to elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, the line, straight people don't know what you're about. Uh, I love you, Sweet right. Leaf. And I was like, th that, that hit me one day when we were driving through whatever, some desolate part of the country. And I was just like, man, you know, it's kind of funny, like, straight people, you know? And it's like, and like, I, I like, I, you know, hey, I, 
I like everyone. I think I I think you should do whatever you want in life as long as you're happy and no one gets hurt. And one of the things that I always, you know, like the 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 repressiveness of our society sometimes doesn't allow people to to express their true feelings, right? So sweet leaf is about freedom, you know, it's about like embr- embracing some other non-conventional form of expression, you know, and and in the most commonly accepted meaning of the song is like the, the the pot smoking weed aspect of it. Right. But what if there was a nod to people who have lived this life where they're denying the sexual, physical desires that they had because they were afraid to embrace those yet and then they met someone who turned them around and they, they made let them allowed them, enabled them to embrace this lifestyle that's not generally accepted by mainstream culture. And if you go through all the lyrics of this song, <laughs> there's things that back that up. And and I'm not saying that that's about it, but I'm saying it's something that popped into my mind while we were driving through whatever, some like wasteland in this country. Ohio. And I think I think it was definitely somewhere in the middle of this, of the country because if you want to talk about repression, maybe that's what was influencing my my like the lens I was seeing the song through might have been influenced by driving through like some ultra conservative part of the country and about how like people have a very uniform thought and would not accept you know other modes of living their lives and i was like maybe that's what influenced my the lens i was seeing the song through but anyway something to consider i might be way off base but you know yeah man well hey a lot of people will say you know lyrics they want you to get you know get out of them what you want to get out of them you know they're not always just literal Uh, this you know these lyrics were probably written in 1970 or yeah, 71, so sure. I don't know if people were thinking as in-depth about these things. I think even more so then than now, people might have been thinking about really? those things. Because, yeah, man, it's like, you know, for how long, I mean, it's been it's not been cool to be gay for a really long time. And, and as far as, like, general, um, you know, mainstream feelings about homosexuality. It's always been something that's been on the fringe as much, and and this music is about being on the fringe. You know, I'm not I'm not making a real I'm not trying to like say this song is about that, but it's just something that popped into my head that it might be about someone who is confused and isn't sure of what their orientation is. They might have met someone who enabled them to express that part of their life. And maybe open a door to a much happier way of living. All right, <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any th- other uh, thoughts on the lyrics? Maybe meaning like, how about children of the grave? What does that mean? That's that's just about <laughs> darkness, man. Yeah. No, I mean, hey, yeah. that's an interesting point. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, it's not a point. It's just a, it's an it's an observation. All right, an observation. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll try to get geezer on. That'd be great, man. I'd love. We'll to get him on the phone. Yeah. Over you know, here. Uh, yeah, that would be amazing. But I don't know if that's within. The realm of uh, possibilities right now. So, you know. <laughs> never know, man. You never hey, know. You know. But do you have any favorite uh, tracks on this record? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to make this easy. My favorite Sabbath song of all time is Into the Void. I think it has two of the best Sabbath riffs of all time, which is saying a lot. Mm-hmm. And then number two, the rest of the album. Yeah, I'm totally taking uh, nah, the, dude, totally. The, the easy way out on this one. I just think it's a perfect album. The interludes are short, perfect. They piece everything together, and every rock track, heavy track on this record is perfect to me. Yeah, I mean, Sweet Leaves the iconic song off of this album. Everyone like for, we sure. talked about it for the last like five minutes or whatever. Right. But, <laughs> but um, for me, the my two the two of the heaviest riffs. In the entire heavy metal world, are on this record, and that's "Into the Void" and "Children of the Grave." Yep, the opening riff. Well, I was going to pick "Children of the Grave" as my second song, and then I, then I was like, I, I can't. I mean, they're just all awesome. Both yeah. of those, they have the heaviest riffs ever written in those two songs. And in "Children of the Grave," that yeah. opening is like I just imagine like a legion of barbarians on horseback, you know. With like severed heads, 
like a Frazetta painting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> like cresting, riding down this like mountainside with like the, the the sun in their to their back, like descending on this like village to like destroy, Just beheading you know? people yeah. on horseback. That's what I think of yeah. when, I, when I hear that riff. Yeah, it's know? very like that triumphant gallop. Yeah, yeah, so good, man. Yeah. Lord of this world is pretty sick too. That's like yeah, man. You know, that's another lyrically. That's a cool song. Into the void. You know, great. Also about like fucking space travel. You know, what right, I mean? right, right. It's great. You yeah. know, maybe uh, Lester Bangs was was right about enjoying the lyrics on this record. You know what I mean? I guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, this record to me also feels like Sabbath at its most like clearest. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like. This has the most um, clear vision of the band in some ways. Well, it's funny, too, because after this record, the first three records were all produced by Roger Bain. Yeah. And then after this record, this is the last record they did with him. Uh-huh. After that, Iomi took over the production. Yeah. And, uh, you know, although I think the production's great on the records that followed this, this record just sounds perfect to me. It does, right? Yeah. It sounds yeah. exactly what I would want it to sound like. Um. You know, then after that, different people stepped in here or there. But, I mean, the first three records, really, you know, they just sound so organic. I can't imagine them sounding any other way. You know, and and though we, we talked briefly about, uh, you know, the, the whole era of Ozzy and the band and, you know, how all those records are great. Um, I have to say this is, out of the, the entire Ozzy era, this is my favorite. You know what I mean? And And I think that, they lost. They, I'm not saying these records are bad, because I do enjoy like all the other albums. Sure, but I feel like they lost a little bit of focus after this record. You know, definitely got a little bit more experimental. Yeah. I mean, still some classic records, classic yeah, heavy, volume four. You know, yeah, yeah, the Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Yep. I mean, but yeah, there's a lot more keyboards become a little more prevalent. Some of that stuff, which I think is cool, man. Like, even Never Say Die. You know, the last record yeah. with Ozzy. I really enjoy that record. Although it's vastly different from this, you know, this record is also included in uh, the the box, the black box. I have that. Yeah, that's a fun thing to have too. Yeah, man, it's you great. Know? Now I have a version of that that's uh, that has uh, you know all the all the, the entire Ozzy era of the band yep. in those like slip cases or the digipacks rather. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Is that is that what you have? Uh, is it the I have the the black literal black box yeah 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 shit i haven't opened it in a long time yeah I, yeah that is what i have it comes with a book yep a big thick book yeah yeah now the big question is how many different formats do you own this record in? <laughs> well right now as we speak which Mark. is this isn't counting copies i've owned before yeah well, this- well in, that in your lifetime how many times have you bought this record or like how many different formats or whatever you know uh, yeah, a lot. I don't know, probably yeah. seven or eight at least. I mean, I own, I have the vinyl now, and I have it in the black box. But well, I have so, had it on CD, singular, I had cassette back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Same here. As aside from eight track, I've had this <laughs> album on every format. Yep. You know, and uh, you know, it's, it's downloaded on my phone from Apple Apple Music. Me too. It's like me too. Vinyl. You know, two different versions of the CD. I have like. The actual, you know, jewel case version, and I have the black box um, digipack <laughs> version. I had the cassette, which I bought when I was in high school. Here's the thing: I am also not done buying it because really? I will continue to buy it. Yeah, because right now the vi- I have the Rhino reissue on yeah. the vinyl, but if I see an original pressing of it somewhere for reasonable, I'll pick that up too. What's it? What's special about the Rhino reissue? It's on a heavier gram. It's yeah, like I don't know. Nothing 180 spe- gram. Nothing special about it. Yeah. I think it's exactly, yeah, I don't think it, oh, was, was it remastered? Yeah, maybe. Mastered from the original, I don't know, it's fucking reissues. Just another way to like, you know. These reissues, they just piss me off sometimes, you know. You know, like this record, I imagine, is, is that a gatefold or just like? No, but they did replicate the original poster that came in it. See, that's what I was going to ask, Which was actually. pretty badass. Yeah. It's not as big, I don't think. Yeah. Um, let me pop this open. Uh, yeah, it's got the cool like. That's oh, dude, that's the one yeah, I want. Sick. I but want wasn't that. the original like twice the size of this? Huh? Maybe this is the no, the yeah. poster from the uh, Inside of Masters of huh. Reality. 
It's like very psychedelic looking like they're hanging out in the forest under a tree. They're all wearing crosses. Yeah, they probably just consumed a bunch of sweet leaf. You would yeah, assume. Some mushrooms or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Some ladies probably consumed. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Ate some human flesh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's the, that's the uh, it's funny. That's the version of the, the LP that I got, okay, went back in the day when I was in high school. I got the uh, like the Best Buy version of it. You know what I mean? You remember Best Buy? Yeah, not yeah, not the department store or the not the store. No, no, Best no, no, Buy. no, not the store. It was that little white and red sticker. Yeah, there was a sticker that they would put on. Like you'd, you'd get it for like four ninety nine. It was like a sale price. It was like a sa- it was like a, a a budget version of the album, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but totally. I didn't know. I didn't know what the hell it was. I, I just, still have some of those. Yeah, it's like. There was a sticker that said Best Buy, like four ninety nine. So I picked up Master of Reality as a Best Buy, and it didn't have the poster. It just was like the you know the the record. Oh, but it was still the vinyl version. It was vinyl, but it didn't have the cool poster in it. So that poster is something I've always wanted to get at some point. I want to I want to f- find that poster and frame it and put it up. Well, now my friend, you could probably go on Amazon. Okay. Order yeah. the Rhino. No, oh, that's a good idea. Reissue. Man. And you get the poster. That's great. See, that's perfect, man. It's, now I know where to get it. You yeah. Know? Yeah, the poster's You cool. can hang it up on your above your bed, <laughs> get a little sweet leaf going, you know, make a night of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, I didn't I didn't realize that that was part of the package there. But, you know, it'd be cool if they put together, like, some deluxe version of that. I, you know, don't quote me on this 100%, but I believe when they did all these uh, Ryan 180 gram reissues, there is... Single and double LP versions okay. of the first five or six albums, all the Ozzy stuff. I just, this was what I had got at the time. Do you order that online? I don't remember. On the if internet? I got it online or I got it at a store. I buy too many records. I can't remember. But I do believe, because I think the self-titled album version I have is a double LP. It has like studio outtakes and stuff. See, that's the kind of stuff I like. Yeah. I love demos. Yeah, I think there is a master's version that has. Nice. I don't know if it's live stuff or yeah. studio outtakes. You know, Sabbath is one of those bands where their live recordings always sound great, too. Oh, fuck yeah. You know, like, like there's that Alive at Last. Yeah, you know which, that one? and Past Lives. Which past I think, Lives I think is, they is merged great. those two to become one double LP or something. Yeah. Past Lives, I think the songs are like slower live than they are like on With, the records. Is that the one that was recorded in Asbury Park? I'm not sure. Some of the tracks. I'm not sure. But the Alive at Last record, I remember when I was in my Sabbath like obsession when I was a kid. That was another Best Buy that I bought. So yeah, that was, who knows what didn't come in that record. That, that I had bought. the shitty like cover, right? Yeah, it was like the picture of like some like a satellite, satellite. <laughs> on a fucking yeah. moon and shit. Like, yeah. Like awesome. Just like, I don't know, like that kind of shit. I love, I love artwork like that. Yeah. And, like the, the logo is in like some... 1980s like digital like font or something yeah like shit. Uh, like the original video game like game over font yeah, yeah. kind of shit and I just remember that record being just like just filled with like feedback and noise and like I'm like wow this is and I knew I knew kids that didn't like that record. I I, like, I didn't love it back then I was like there's too much like weirdness going there on. there was too like I I shouldn't have liked that because I right. wasn't really like like that should have stuck out to me as being not as a not a good record necessarily, <laughs> but you liked it because I came out of listening to like the song remains the same, you know Led Zeppelin, the live records the, that are questionable if they were really live or not. Well, a song is there is there a controversy about that being maybe live? not that one, but uh, one of my well, favorite Thin Lizzy's live record apparently, and uh, the the Judas Priest one oh, Unleashed, Unleashed in the, in the East, East, which yeah. is my probably my favorite live record of all time or one of them. Huh. I guess that one has uh, supposedly a lot of studio I, trickery going on. I didn't on. know that. Yeah. But be that as it may, like you, you know, whatever. At the time I thought it was real, you True. know. So I came from like listening to like live records that were like sounded great, right? You know? And then I picked up Alive at Last and at first I was like just like feedback and, like <laughs> we love you. Like he's like yelling and stuff and the songs they don't sound right or whatever. There's like they're, they're all fucked up sounding, but like right. I don't know, it, and it just really, it. I guess the in general, Black Sabbath was a band that I, the first time I heard the Ozzy version of the band because I, I heard Dio first. Yeah, right. We had uh, we talked about different this. stories yeah. with that. Yeah, the opposite story. When I heard Ozzy, I didn't 
what the fuck is this? You know, like right. the shit, the guitars are all out of tune and all this guy, <laughs> this guy can't sing or whatever. And I guess the same thing applied to that live record where it was like, it was, it just, it touched something in my fucking brain that really inspired me to like it. You know what right. I mean? And uh, yeah, so that's a, I have a soft spot in my heart for that record. I like it more now. Yeah. And the crazy thing is that years later, decades later, they reformed yes. for the most part. You know, with fairly pretty much the same people, except for yeah. the drumming. You know, Bill Ward wasn't able to do a lot of that. Right. You know, and uh, I remember all through the 90s, I was thinking, like, I'd never, because Sabbath, they had those reunions around OzFest, and I always kicked myself for not going. I didn't go to those either. I didn't go to them either, because I was like, nah, that wasn't my thing. I'm like, no, I'm not going to some, right. you know, big event like that, you know, too cool for that shit, yeah. too underground, whatever. And I'm thankful that I got a chance to see Sabbath with more or less the original lineup perform all these great songs in like an out. I saw it outside. I mean, you were at the same show in Jersey. Jersey. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The PNC Arts Center. Yeah. So that, was, and that was the first time either one of us had seen Sabbath. That's right. Yeah. And I was like, this is, I feel thankful for that. It was great. Yeah. It, and it was everything I hoped it would be. Yeah, I remember the lights went down, and I was just making my way back to my seat, and it was just went pitch black, and all of a sudden the sirens started from War Pigs. Oh yeah, yeah. And it, you know, as much as like War Pigs is a little bit played out live. when you're there live in that environment, dude. Like, yeah, the hair, hairs were standing up on my neck. I, I got chills. Me too, man. It was yeah. it was, all, and they were great that night. Ozzy sounded good. The whole band killed. I see them once after that too, on the end tour, and they were just as good, man. Yeah, I only yeah. saw them just that one time, man, and it was great. I'm glad I got a chance to see it. You know, and yeah, this record means a lot to me, man. And and um, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that I I listen to this. I listen to it today. <laughs> you know, I've been listening to it a lot this week. Yeah, I mean, I normally whenever we do these episodes, I always listen to the record while I'm putting the notes together. I do the same thing. But, yeah. But this morning on the way over here, I, I I ran it. I ran the whole album, even though you know it's 34 minutes long, but, <laughs> and it yeah. sounded just as good as it ever did. Yeah, right? it's yeah. great. You know, undeniably awesome record. Totally. Praise Iomi. <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of Metal Matters, a Gimme Radio weekly podcast. Tune in next week and see what we have in store for you. The show is available on all streaming platforms, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, etc. Also, be sure to check out Gimme Radio, streaming on the web, iOS, or Android for one of the best metal communities, exclusive merch, interviews with artists, and so much more. I'll catch you guys next week. Take care. We are searching for your mind.